what happened here basically was that a, uh, this mill was unionized from the, almost the very beginning, from 1882, had a contract in 1889. So there was for three years prior, they had a very strong union organization here. It was uh, arguably the most productive mill in the world at the time. Uh, they were making money hand over fist, and the workers were very well paid. Uh, but in, uh, in July, uh, Carnegie had gone to uh, Scotland, and in July, Frick, who was left in charge of the company and was determined to break the union, mostly not because of the money, although money was certainly involved, uh, but it was because of control. And he wanted absolute control over the way that the mill was run. And every time they put in new equipment or machinery, there would be a committee from the union wanting to know who was going to work there, how the whole thing was going to operate. And that was the critical issue, was control. So on July the 6th, uh, 1892, they had been locked out at the end of June. And uh, there were guards and all kinds of sympathetic people who notified the townsfolk at 3 a.m. that two barges of 300 Pinkerton, armed Pinkertons, were coming to land right outside the door here. The mill was surrounded by a fence, they called it Fort Frick, and uh, the workers broke through that and were here at this site at about 6 a.m. when the two barges arrived. And that about 7 o'clock an attempted landing uh, was effectuated. The uh, head of the Pinkertons was wounded in the initial exchange, and then a gun battle went on until 5 in the afternoon when the leadership of the union, which had dissolved the day before at the Bose building, uh, because they knew a confrontation was coming and didn't want the organization to be destroyed, they decided to move back in and take control because they were afraid that all 300 Pinkertons were going to be killed. Uh, and they did not want that on the backs of the Union. So the uh, surrender was effectuated with the head of the Union, went down over the uh, hillside, took the white flag from the Pinkertons, brought them up through, People having been killed, including a young, very well-known Irish guy, 26 years old, a number of kids, was one of the first killed out of the window right over there. When he was carried through the town, it very riled the town up. So when the Pinkertons were, came through, a gauntlet was formed. Mostly women uh, beat up the Pinkertons as they were taken by the Union up to uh, a music hall and, imp and imprisoned there. And so the, the entire town was very well organized by the Union, and uh, it wasn't until the state troops came in five days later that control of the town and mill was arrested uh, from the Union. And that point on, the strike went on until October, but it was broken, and that instituted then began the 12-hour day, seven-day week. After that, wages went down about 40 percent, and uh, control was completely lost on the shop floor to the workers. So. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks right. for your question. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, I did the paintings in here on the banners on the windows, which were originally functional, and then we decided to find something appropriate and uh, to embellish them with, and we tried to do what Tom's doing with his music, which is, uh, well, you can't see them all, but the, there's, there's 10 figures here that represent the, uh, the 10 decades of this mill, of this site, and relate to this, to this building in one way or another. And I think why this is important and why we have to do what Tom's doing and why we have to have visuals is, uh, was brought forth when I was hanging these up and uh, I was here by myself, and the door was open, and there was, a, uh, I believe, a school teacher with uh, three kids, maybe 10 to 12 years old, with her. And she was sort of walking around, and I invited them to come in, and I gave them a little tour of the place. And I was trying to, you know, they were very attentive, but they were kind of giving me a blank stare. And, and uh, I, I mentioned steel mills, and I, I pointed down downwind here to the, uh, to the complex, the shopping complex. And I said, all those large buildings there in a, could have been put into, the, into a, the broom closet in the steel mill because they were so big. And, uh, and the one kid looked to me and he said, what's a steel mill? 
And it just sort of was a crushing thing, I mean, that the, he, he would be on this site and living in this area and at the age of 12 or 13 not know what a steel mill was. I, I love your paintings. Um, what I don't understand is if the um, if Frick wanted the um, the control over the workers, then um, then why were they locked out of the mill? Why were they locked out of the pump house if um, Frick wanted control over the workers and he wanted them to just basically work? Well, and to put it in terms, let me. Uh Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of the opposite of a strike. If they put their workers out of work, then eventually they expect those workers to come back and beg for their jobs because they'll be hungry and they won't be able to feed their families. Okay, thanks. Sure. So it was the sheer determination uh, and perseverance of these workers and their families to get through times like that. Tom, I have one last question. The music of the Appalachians has been a real inspiration to you in your own work. Tell us why. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, I, I think music in Appalachia was so important for many years because in, in, in a lot of ways it was the primary way of communicating. Um, especially in my state of West Virginia where there's so many mountains, word of important events would travel sometimes more quickly through song than they would through uh, newspapers or whatnot. Um, so I think with that in mind, the songs always had a purpose to document something or, or a reminder that of certain things that were. And also, there's this great history in Appalachia that, you know, before televisions and radio and whatnot, that was the form of entertainment. And that's what the family did together. The family made music together. And uh, I think that that's a pretty special thing. Well, Tom, you have taught us so much in this program. It's been wonderful. Um, what final thoughts do you have for us? What would you like us to take away from this program? I think uh, the reoccurring theme of just remembering the great sacrifices that those who came before us made and remembering their legacy and remembering their sacrifices so that we don't start to see things, the hands of time turn back to the way things were in the early part of the 1900s. Well, thank you again, Tom. And before we go, you've got a final song for us. Uh, thank you very much, Tracy. And I'd like to leave all of you with this song. This town is more than a few old buildings More than an empty factory More than a bridge that crosses a river It's just a part of me And I've been up and down this highway
some folks stayed around. But like the families before them, they do the best with what they have. And those people I remember whenever times get bad. I know it's just a small town But I will always call it home Like my father never failed to remind me Who you are is where you come from Who you are Thank you so much, Tom, for a wonderful performance and for the lessons that you have taught us about our shared history. It is so important for us to take the time to share these stories. We want to thank Tom Briding. We want to thank our wonderful audience for the questions that they asked. They help us to learn even more, and they shared some wonderful personal stories. We want to thank them for that. Of course, we want to thank Rivers of Steel for hosting such a wonderful event here at the Pump House. We couldn't have done it without them. We want you to know that Humanities on the Road is a collaboration between the Pennsylvania Human Humanities Council and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. And if you're interested in finding out more about where we're going, what we're learning along the way, the conversations that we're starting, we would invite you to check out the website. It is humanitiesontheroad.org, humanitiesontheroad.org. There you'll find our broadcast schedule, and there's lots of cool bonus stuff, some behind the scenes interviews, and just some great stuff. So we encourage you to check it out. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Humanities on the Road. I'm Tracy Matisak, and we'll see you next time.